Good morning everyone and welcome to Bransgore Community Church and our virtual service. You might have been with us for the full length of lockdown right since that very first week back in March and if you are have been then welcome to you. But if this is your very first time with us and you've not been to BCC's online services before, you are equally welcome and it's great that you've been able to join us this week. I hope that your weeks have been good. There seems to have been a lot of change in the last few weeks. We've seen the opening up of coffee shops and restaurants and pubs. We've seen the opening of hair salons and nail bars. And for some of you, you might have been to the gym or even an outdoor swimming pool. Whatever it is that you have experienced in terms of change, I hope you have found things that have benefited you and your families. But change isn't always easy, and I know that sometimes it can be difficult, and for some of you, you might be feeling like it's all a lot of change, and actually the streets are busier, the shops are busier, and you're finding that difficult. So I thought that we would just open in prayer, because whatever the change is, we know that ultimately God is in control. So let's just pray as we start this morning's service. Heavenly Father, we thank you that no matter what happens and our circumstances, you are the one who is ultimately in control. Thank you that nothing happens that you don't know about. Thank you that we can bring everything to you and lay it at your feet. And so we bring this morning's service to you now and pray that you would be with each and every one of us and that we will be blessed as we join together to worship you. Amen. As I was preparing for this morning's service, there was a verse from Psalms that came to me. And so before we worship, I'd just like to read that to you. It's Psalm 28, verse 7. And it says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy, and I will give thanks to him in song. So let's do that now as John leads us in worship. Give me this 
I'll follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust your promise, you'll carry me safe to shore. going to introduce you to our fab eight who we have watched grow from little stars into rockets and then become extreme and now they're off to their territory called youth so today is the day we're going to say goodbye, goodbye to them and I know I'm speaking on behalf of all the children's ministry leaders and um, when I say that we are going to miss them so much each one of these children has brought so much to Cosmic and it has been such a joy and a pleasure to have spent these past Sunday mornings with you. You are all unique and you are all amazing children. So I'm going to introduce you to them one by one. Sam. Sam, it has been a real joy watching you grow over the years but you're still not liking the singing though. And Lily, I loved seeing how you enjoyed Chatterbox last year 
making new friends and being part of all that was going on. Annabelle, a joy watching you learn the signing to the Lord's Prayer and being able to remember it, to teach it back to all, to all of us. Great teaching skills, Annabelle. Jess, great team player, enjoying all the fun and enthusiastically taking part in all, as in all aspects of Cosmic. Lovely hearing you sing too, Jess. Ah, Chloe, such a gentle, willing spirit, ready to use your gifts of singing whenever asked. Thank you, Chloe. Ah, now we've got the artist in our group, Maddie. Loved seeing your creativity in all the craft we did over the years. Ben, we all enjoyed listening to you testifying how God healed you when you were so poorly. A great witness for Jesus to all those who nursed you whilst you were in hospital. And Liam, loved how you always listened so intently and were always ready to share your very good thoughts with us all. So you can see, children, we have really learnt from being your teachers and leaders. So thank you for all that you have given to us. And I just hope that you have a fantastic, fantastic time in your youth group, which I'm sure you will. Um, you're going up to a very good, good group of leaders and, and helpers. So we wish you all the very, very best. But now, I'd just like to pray for you. Father, we thank you for each and every one of our children in Cosmic. And in particular, these eight who are moving up to youth. Lord, it hasn't been easy for them these last four months. And they will soon be going to senior school without having all the usual preparation that they would have had at this time. Father, we ask that you will be behind them, alongside them, and in front of them. We pray for understanding and sensitive new teachers who are aware of the needs of each of these children. We pray too that each child will not be anxious and that they will feel excitement rather than anxiety. We pray for new friendships and the renewing of old ones and that they will not feel lost in their new larger school. We pray too that the seeds planted throughout the years in Cosmic will grow and flourish through the power of your Holy Spirit as they move up to youth. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. And Lord, now as each of these young people transition, Lord, would you help the youth team to be those who have wisdom, who would be those who would guide and disciple and lead each of these young people into greater revelation of who you are and who they are in you. Lord, we pray friendships would be lifelong ones as those who are already in youth become good friends of those who are joining. And Lord, we pray for each family as these young people transition into secondary school and into youth. Lord, that you would be with each one, that each one would be richly blessed and that this would be a marker in their life which they can look back to with great fondness. So Lord, we ask your rich blessing on each one of these young people. And Lord, as we think of those transitioning, we also lift to you now, Matt and Benji. Lord, we thank you for the years in which they have been involved in youth work. And Lord, as they prepare to go off to university, Lord, would you go before them? Would you prepare the path ahead of them? Lord, good friendships, stability, fun in their studies. Lord, that they might find a home in where they're studying, a community in which they can belong a community in which they can grow in their discipleship with you. So Lord, we ask now all these things in Jesus' mighty name. And Lord, that your blessing would come upon each one of our children and our young people. And we ask this all now in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for all of the children who've bravely been back at school and for those who stay at home to do their learning. Also, thank you for the amazing teachers who've been teaching kids in school and wish a speedy recovery to teachers who are homesick. Please help our teachers make the right decision about making students and teachers safe in school. I pray that Jesus will be with those who should have done GCSEs, A-levels and degrees and missed out. And thank you for all of the mums and dads at home who have struggled to teach their children. Thank you for the summer holidays and everyone having a break and relaxing from homeschool. I pray that people will be able to take the opportunity to go out and enjoy the warm weather. Amen.
There is no doubt that different situations require different responses. There's no point calling the water company if your electric's gone out. Nor is there any point calling a lifeguard if you're stuck up a mountain. The way in which we respond matters. And above everything, the most important response that we're gonna make in our lives is that to the call of God. We may find ourselves in scenarios that make that right response harder to see. Situations that are emotionally taxing, physically demanding, or spiritually draining. So today, we're gonna to be looking at Elijah, a prophet terrified by a threat to his life. We're going to be looking at his response to God and God's response to Elijah. So let's turn to 1 Kings 19 verses 1 to 18. Today's reading comes from 1 Kings 19 verses 1 to 18. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, travelling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel forty days and forty nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn, torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face into his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, Go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazel to be the king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be the king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel, Mahola, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazel will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. Elijah had thought it was all over. For three years, the drought he'd prophesied to King Ahab had ravaged the land. The drought he'd prophesied because that was what the Lord had said would come if Israel turned her back on him. Under King Ahab, egged on by his queen, the worship of the regional pagan god Baal had become institutionalised in the nation. 
Ahab had even built a temple to Baal in the capital. So now, at Elijah's word, the drought had come, the crops had failed, the animals were starving. He finally reappeared before the king and issued a challenge. Baal was a god of thunder and lightning and rain, but the life-giving rain had stayed away. Let's see, said Elijah, whether Baal or the Lord is really in charge of the elements. Let's see whether Baal or the Lord can throw down fire from heaven on an animal sacrifice. And for all their shouting and leaping, cavorting, cutting themselves, Baal's 450 prophets could not produce the slightest response from their god, their non-god. So there, on Mount Carmel, Elijah had built an altar and called on the Lord, and fire had fallen from heaven to consume Elijah's sacrifice. Then, as the people cried out, the Lord, he is God, and Elijah prayed, Storm clouds came in from the sea, and the longed-for rain fell in torrents. It had all completely justified Elijah's trust in the Lord's promises and power. From the scene of the victory, he'd run back ahead of King Ahab to the royal headquarters at Jezreel, like an outrider, announcing what had happened and what the official policy was now going to be. But he hadn't reckoned with Queen Jezebel. Jezebel, what's in a name? Even today people use it to conjure up a picture of a particularly nasty type of person, even though they may have no idea who the original was. Jezebel, the princess from the Phoenician city of Sidon, up along the coast, whom King Ahab had married in some sort of political alliance. Jezebel, whose name meant, where is Baal, and who lived up to her name with a fierce devotion to those regional gods. Jezebel, a far stronger character than her husband, who wasn't going to let a setback like this get in the way of her plans. This wasn't a question of a nice Radio 4 debate between a couple of rival philosophies or lifestyles. To her mind, Worship of Baal was crucial for national status and prosperity and for her own well-being. What did she blame the drought on? She blamed it on the prophets of the Lord interfering with the proper worship of Baal. It was because of them, she thought, that Baal had withheld the reins, which was why she'd gone on a campaign of slaughtering them while Elijah was in hiding. So when she got the news from Ahab of what had happened on Mount Carmel, she knew what to do. Elijah had to die. And Elijah, who had faced up to the king with the threat of God's judgment, who had seen God doing miracle after miracle while he'd been in hiding, who had finally faced down 450 prophets of Baal in a life and death contest at Carmel, Elijah ran for his life. A hundred miles down to Beersheba, the southernmost town in the land, and even then he didn't stop. He discharged his servant and walked for a further day into the desert, found a bit of shade, sat down, and in a fit of despair and self-loathing, asked God to take his life away. However could this man, who had seen God display his power time and time again, however could he end up in this pitiful situation? Mind you, Perhaps we shouldn't be too surprised. Nearly 900 years later, one of those who wrote the New Testament 
said of Elijah that he was human, just like us. Anyone who's ever felt low, depressed, fearful, any one of us knows that you don't always understand why you're feeling that way. It can be quite illogical or hidden behind something you hadn't even recognised in the depths of your mind. Even feeling out of sorts with God, that most ridiculous mood of all, well, we can experience that without really knowing why. God's response is typical. He gives Elijah some food. Not a telling off about deserting his post. Not a lecture about how prophets ought to behave. Not even a vision of heaven. God knows that what Elijah needs is to rehydrate and get his blood sugar levels up. We're not told what Elijah thought about this interruption to the dark sleep from which he hadn't wanted to wake up. He doesn't seem surprised, just one more miracle in the life of a prophet. But he's hungry and thirsty, so he eats and drinks and goes back to sleep. God leaves him to rest again and then the whole thing is repeated. Except that this time the angel doing the cooking mentions a journey for which Elijah will need sustenance. Well, where did that come from? Whose idea was the journey? God doesn't tell Elijah to go walk about. Elijah himself has no particular aim so far except to get away from Jezebel. But from this solitary bush he starts out on an extended wandering for 40 days at the end of which he finds himself 200 miles further south, at the very mountain where God had met with Moses hundreds of years before. The place where Moses had spent his 40 days in the presence of God. The place where the nation of Israel had been constituted as God's people. So he finds a cave to spend the night. Except it doesn't actually say a cave. Well, your Bible does. But what the author wrote was the cave. And there is one cave that we know about on this mountain. The one where Moses had been when God met with him in a quite spectacular way. What had been going on in Elijah's head during those six weeks of walking? Had he come to this place deliberately, perhaps subconsciously? Was it his underlying commitment to God's laws and covenant that had led him here? Does he yet understand what has happened? Well, we'll soon find out. In the morning, for the first time since the events at Mount Carmel, Elijah hears God speak to him, and it's a question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Well, good question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Are you here in obedience to God's directions? Are you here on a mission? Are you here to recover your sanity? Are you here because you had nowhere else to go? Exactly. Why are you here, Elijah? Do you even know why you're here? It's a good question for me as well from time to time. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I feeling what I'm feeling? Is it all part of God's plan for me? Or have I somehow lost my way? Got all tied up with something else? Forgotten what I'm supposed to be about as a believer. Is that why life's jigsaw just seems to be a box of unconnected pieces? Do I understand the bits of my temperament that make me susceptible to running away, stressing out, 
losing the plot? The only thing that these six weeks appear to have done for Elijah is to enable him to give God an answer. But what a response! I've been very jealous for the Lord. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and killed your prophets. I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. In other words, all is lost and I'm feeling very sorry for myself. Well, I can identify with that a bit as well. Especially when I'm feeling down and I don't know why or even when I do know why. But what a distorted pattern of thinking this reveals. Somewhere between his self-centeredness and his self-loathing, Elijah has got lost. He thought it was all about him, that his way of doing things was the only way, that he was the only one left, that they were all out to get him, and he has completely ignored what God did on Mount Carmel. No wonder he was feeling so desperate. But there's something here even more serious than Elijah's being in such a pitiful state. God had chosen the nation of Israel to show the world what he was like, to reveal to the world what his purposes were, to be the place where his presence was made manifest for all to see, to be a blessing to the nations. For the king to bring in Baal worship completely compromised that whole mission. How can you reveal God to the world when what sits at the centre of your own community life is idolatry? And so God had sent Elijah with this fundamental challenge. Is it the Lord or Baal who is truly God? No contest. And the people had cried out, the Lord, he is God. And if Elijah, the focal point of resistance to Baal, had stayed in Jezreel, holding Eli Ahab to his word, facing up to Jezebel, perhaps the nation would have truly returned to its God-given role. But he'd run away. Elijah, whose very name meant the Lord is my God, had deserted his post. What now for the mission of Israel? Okay, says God, go out of the cave and stand on the mountain in my presence, for I'm about to pass by. What an invitation! Shades of what he'd done with Moses all those years before. So what does Elijah do? He stays in the cave. Elijah, who had done everything up until Carmel at the word of the Lord, could not bring himself to obey God and leave the cave. And the wind and the earthquake and the fire passed by just the sort of experience of God Elijah was familiar and comfortable with. Even in the cave you couldn't miss them. But after that, something different. Something he wasn't used to. Something strange, a gentle whisper. The sound of silence. He tried to get his mind around it and failed. And so, long after the fireworks had finished, Elijah finally came out of the cave with his cloak over his face. And God speaks again. What are you doing here, Elijah? Same question as before. But if you were hoping that the fireworks, or even the whisper, might produce a better response, 
you're going to be disappointed. Elijah's answer is exactly the same. All is still lost and I'm still feeling very sorry for myself. And yet, something has changed. For God knows that he can now address Elijah's issues directly. He starts by dealing with the simple fact that Elijah had run away from being a prophet. How does God deal with this? He restores him by giving him some new tasks to do, including appointing a young man, Elisha, to be his deputy and successor. Yet those tasks were nothing like the fireworks Elijah was more in tune with. In God's name, he was to go and anoint Hazael, a Syrian official, to be king of Syria, and Jehu, an Israelite, to be king of Israel. And as you read on through the story, you find that it was those two men who eventually brought about the downfall of Ahab's family and the end of Baal worship in Israel. God certainly was going to deal with the problem of Baal, but it would be through the processes of history and even politics. The time for Elijah's fireworks was over. The second thing God says comes as both a surprise and a challenge. Elijah had known about a hundred prophets of God that had been kept safe from Jezebel's murderous intentions, but perhaps had conveniently forgotten them in his self-centred gloom. Now God tells him there were actually 7,000 in Israel who had remained true to the Lord. He wasn't alone at all. Elijah probably found God's word to him quite hard. It wasn't the sort of thing he was used to. But at least he was now listening again. Maybe he had needed those six weeks for it all to come to the surface, for him to face up what his commitment to the Lord really entailed. Did he ever completely come to terms with those elements in his personality that had made him so susceptible? Discovering that what he'd thought was a final victory was no such thing had unsettled him more than anyone could have imagined. It had challenged both his presuppositions about how God would work and his assumptions about where he fitted in to God's plans. In the end, he had to learn that there was a place both for fireworks and for God to act in quieter, perhaps more ordinary ways. In spite of these events, Elijah is quite rightly treated as a hero in the rest of the Bible. He stood out as an example for prophets who would challenge the nation's faithlessness and call it to be true to the Lord. The real hero in this chapter, of course, is the Lord himself, who recognised what had happened with Elijah, sustained him, encouraged him, put up with his waywardness, brought him out of his pit of despair, and in the end drew him back to find his proper place within God's purposes. It's exactly what he does with us as well. When others might tell us to buck up and just get on with things, God knows when it's a time for him simply to nourish us. When others might be a bit too sympathetic about how we're feeling, God knows it's the right time to give us a new perspective and a fresh task. He's never caught out by our waywardness. He's never deceived by our self-deception. He's never weakened by our stress or failure. He knows what is needed. His timing 
is perfect. And he has his own ways of fulfilling his purposes, whether by spectacular or seemingly routine means. Elijah did not know, of course, that one day God would reveal himself, not just in wind, and rain and fire, but as a man. A man who would himself spend 40 days in the desert, facing his demons. A man whose ultimate victory was to be won, not with fire from heaven, but with weakness, with suffering, with death on a cross. A man whose victory would indeed destroy the idols forever and be the foundation for us who bear his name to go and take God's message to a desperately needy world. In the end, the way out for Elijah was to listen to God's voice and respond to it. He didn't find that easy. It entailed him accepting a new perspective about God's ways and about his own place in God's plans. But to find himself again in the presence of God, listening to his voice and embracing his mission, that was the way forward for Elijah. And it is the way forward for us. We're just going to take a moment of quiet reflection to think about and respond to the things that Martin has said. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are sorry for the things that we have run away from you about. We are sorry for the times when we have tried to escape rather than draw nearer to you. We are sorry for the times that we have tried to hide things from you. And we are sorry for the things that we have not brought to you when we should have done. So, Father, we bring those things that we are struggling with before you now. We bring before you, Lord, the struggles we're facing at the moment. We bring before you situations that are causing us anxiety or stress or depression. We bring before you changes that we are worried about. And we bring before you people we are concerned for. Father, we're sorry for the times that we have not listened for your voice and for what you're saying about these situations. And so, Father, now, in the quiet, 
we come to you and ask you to speak to us. My soul finds rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken. Though lips may bless and hearts may curse, and lies like arrows bless me, I'll fix my heart on
us to the end of our virtual service this morning and I really hope that you've been blessed by being part of it and joining with us. Don't forget that you can click on connect after the service and join us for Zoom chat and virtual coffee. Let's just pray as we close before we go out into our week. Be with us Lord as we go out into the world. May the lips that have sung your praises always speak the truth. May the ears that have heard your word listen only to what is good. And may our thoughts, as well as our worship, be always pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.